So some of the most distressing pains that I've ever seen is people who have burning mouth and burning tongue. And I've even had some cases that the person turns their head and their tongue goes numb. So we're just going to wow. kind of explain the neurology. And then Hauser's law is when there is a symptom or a disease, a diagnosis, and nobody knows the cause, if you follow the neurology, the neurology will lead to ligamentous joint instability. So we're going to talk about like just the neurology of the tongue and the mouth. So why don't you explain some of the nerve entrapment syndromes we see? Yeah, so we actually see quite a few of them in our office. Um, so burning mouth syndrome, which we'll talk about, brachial neuritis, carpal tunnel, very, very common, radiculopathy, sciatica, you know, included in that, occipital neuralgia, pudendal neuralgia, also a very common one that we see, and trigeminal neuralgia as well. Our goal, really our objective, is to follow the neurology and try to figure out what exactly is causing that, and if there is a joint instability component, can we resolve it with prolotherapy? Yeah, I'm just thinking about burning mouth because the common history that you and I both get is that I saw a dentist and they, you know, they yeah. had their wisdom teeth out or this or that. Sure. So they sometimes have trouble figuring out like, well, it occurred after that, so it must be that, but how would you explain like how could a dental procedure relate to cervical instability? Sure, so usually it's not the procedure, it, like the actual procedure itself that damaged a nerve or anything like that, but rather the position that the patient had to stay in for an extended period of time while the procedure was being done. So like if you look here, especially related to the mouth, the upper cervical spine, our vertebrae C1 and C2, these nerves actually are connected to the hypoglossal nerve that goes to the tongue. So it's not unfathomable that if somebody had a neck instability at C1, C2, maybe those tissues were strained during a procedure or bad posture or whatnot, that it actually could affect the nerve input to the tongue and the mouth. The patients that I'm thinking of, they're almost always very, very loose jointed women. I'm not saying they're all that way. No, I would but agree. I guess maybe another take home point is if you're really loose jointed and you have clicking, popping, grinding in the neck and you are gonna uh, like go to a hairdresser mm -hmm. or you know have some dental work, try to keep your neck in a neutral position because all those chairs, you know, the, mm -hmm. like, you know, the chairs go all the way down. There's not a reason, you know, so if you're really loose jointed, you know, and you have clicking, popping, grinding in your neck and you're like that for 45 minutes, you know, you could end up with significant upper cervical instability. Yeah. And even like the hairdresser, like you said, a lot of times they have a big sink that has that kind of hard divot in it. That's just not, um, doesn't always put the right kind of pressure on your C1, C2. Right, so it's, not, it's not designed that yeah, way. Yeah, so don't be yeah. like that, you know, because even that, it, you know, we've had patients where their problems started there. I've seen a number of those patients myself, and now whenever I go to the hairdresser, I wash my hair before I go. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. No, you have, because, yeah. you know, you don't want to end no, up with upper yeah. cervical instability. So what's the connection between burning mouth or burning tongue and the trigeminal nerve? Sure. So this is actually a really easy graphic. So if you look at the trigeminal ganglion here, if we go, there's actually a branch, part of tympani, that goes off of the trigeminal ganglion to feed the mouth. So you actually made this analogy earlier. When people get this kind of burning mouth, it's basically a nerve disruption, right, or a nerve pinching. It's almost like sciatica of your mouth. We understand sciatica or we've heard of it before. Yeah. That's essentially what it is just at the corda tympani. I've done a lot of MRIs on for the trigeminal nerve. Almost all of them come back normal. And part of the reason is these little branches, they're very hard to see you yeah. know, on MRI. So sometimes you just have to assume that that's what's going on. Then how do you make the connection between the trigeminal nerve and the upper cervical? Well, like we just described, you know, in the upper cervical spine at C1 and C2, the trigeminal nucleus actually lays right by there. So if C1 and C2 are, are moving more, wobbling more, shifting more, it could easily encroach on that or pinch it. And then also, let's say the um, CSF flow dynamics are off, meaning that you're getting kind of a backup of fluid from jugular vein compression that can also spill out onto the trigeminal ganglion. Yeah. I had a really funny case, so I'll just call the patient's name Mary. So Mary comes in. I'm like, Mary, 
how long has your tongue and your mouth burned? And she goes, 10 years. I go, are you serious? You've lived with this thing for wow. 10 years? She goes, yeah, yeah, 10 years. And she had a complicated dental history and different things 10 years ago. Then I said, this was at a point when we were, I was numbing the neck before we did DMXs. Mm -hmm. No, this was at a point when we were, I was numbing the neck, then we would do a DMX. We don't, you know, we only numb in certain yeah. positions certain scenarios. So I said, you know, why don't I just do this? I'm going to block the C1 nerve and the C2 nerve because I have to do it anyway to do your DMX. And then, you know, we'll just see if I block this nerve and this nerve, like what happens to your tongue, you know, the burning mouth and burning tongue. So, you know, I go in there like a half an hour later or something and I go, well, you know, how's your burning mouth or burning tongue? Well, you block the nerve, my mouth and my tongue are numb. I go, Mary, I said, you know, like, yeah. she's like, well, obviously they, it doesn't hurt. And I go, Mary, this is the first time in 10 years, you know, your tongue and your mouth hasn't hurt. So, I mean, I just blocked the nerve here. And then, wow. the, you know, so obviously the irritation of the, some branch of the trigeminal nerve was actually way down here. So, yeah, that was just, so, I mean, that's, that's just, that's just definitive of, that you can get problems here and it give you trigeminal neuralgia or irritation of different branches of the trigeminal mm -hmm. nerve. And this just kind of, these were the nerves that I blocked the C1 or gotcha. C2. So anybody with burning mouth or burning tongue then, we would ask them at home, do you have tension up here? And what are maybe some other signs or symptoms of C1, C2, or upper cervical instability? Yeah, tension definitely, especially in these like little tiny muscles here at the base of your skull, might be tender to touch. Sometimes patients could even get headaches or even just pain or headaches that kind of refer up over their head. Clicking, popping, crunching, dizziness, lightheadedness, all very common symptoms also associated with C1, C2. Yeah. With that comes what we term cervical destructure, so breakdown of the cervical curve. Yeah. And we say this often, but the problem is when your cervical curve is terrible, the C1, C2, it has to hyperextend, because otherwise, like if your curve is right. reversed, so C1, C2 has to kind of go like that. So that's gonna make it more prone to being unstable, and if it's unstable, then you get yeah. all the different various symptoms of upper cervical instability, and of course, Beside just burning mouth and burning tongue, you can get jugular vein compression and what it can that cause? It will cause intracranial hypertension, so basically increase of pressure in your brain. Yeah, and then also with the vagus nerve problems, so just refer everybody to watch some of the vagus nerve videos that we've made. So if somebody has burning mouth, numb tongue, burning tongue from upper cervical instability and cervical destructure, what would be the treatment? Really, you got to resolve the joint instability, you know, like kind of like with your patient, Mary, like you were saying, you know, you, you did a really great nerve block and that got rid of the pain, but it's, that's going to wear off, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to yeah. provide long-term benefit unless you actually can do a good job of getting the pressure off the nerve itself. Yeah. So if there is an upper cervical instability component that needs to be resolved. And if, again, like if it's ligamentous in nature, the best way to do that is with prolotherapy. Yeah, and then if they, and if they have cervical destructure, you and I also note the C1 and C2 space. Yes. And then that space often is narrowed, you know, when a mm -hmm. person leads with the chin. So one of the things that somebody could do at home, just to, you know, again, just to sort of see, is there a instability component to it? One thing you could do is, of course, brace. Yep. You know, and we use the Eclipse brace a lot. Any sort of brace that doesn't block jugular vein, but and then have the uh, mandibular piece, the front piece here, be have it a little bit down as if you're looking 10 feet in front of you. And when you flex your head, that opens up the space for the C1 and C2 nerves. So somebody could wear that yeah. for like a week or two weeks and just see if the burning mouth or burning tongue gets better. And if it does, then obviously, you know, they yeah. need to get correction of the upper cervical instability. One thing they can try is upper cervical chiropractic care. So upper cervical chiropractic care like orthospinology, mm -hmm. NUCA, Atlas orthogonal is very gentle. 
But if you don't hold the adjustment, then right. of course, consider getting prolotherapy.